Good morning and welcome to today's You and Your Team webinar for New South Wales Small Business Month. My name is Julie Goddard, Small Business Liaison Officer for Narrabri Shire Council, and it is my absolute pleasure to be joined by Rebecca Bing this morning of House Paddock Training and Consulting. Good morning, Beck. Hello again, Julie. How are you? I'm really well, and we are so grateful to have you here today to present this webinar. As you all are probably aware, October is New South Wales Small Business Month and Narrabri Shire Council has collaborated with a team of partners, including Narrabri Chamber of Commerce, WeWar Chamber, Bogabri Chamber and Narrabri Industrial Network to present a raft of activities this October. So without any further ado, we will present over to Beck, who will be conducting our workshop today. Thanks, Beck. Thank you so much, Julie, uh, and thank you very much to those amazing organisations, um, not just for having me on today, but for having me back. Um, I know that a lot of the people that are dialed in this morning um, were with us yesterday. I was having a look at the list. Um, and if not, I had a couple of ladies that um, had a couple of hits to me yesterday. So uh, welcome uh, if it is your first time um, uh, listening in on this uh, webinar series, or welcome back if you've uh, decided Excited and chosen to come back um, and join us again today. A little bit of a change of, um, of topic today. We are talking about um, your team, your, uh, your business's um, workforce, your staff. Uh, we are going to talk about um, human resource management and, and workplace relations. So we're going to talk about both the soft and the legal side of getting your team uh, right and where you fit. Um, if you are dialing in as a business owner or a manager, maybe a supervisor, where you actually fit in that, um, uh, in that team um, and what your role is and what your role isn't. Um, what I might do, if I, if I could, I'm really keen um, to hear uh, who's on the line and also what industry you're from so we can contextualise potentially some of the examples. So I'm going to pop in the, um, uh, in the chat box um, a little, hopefully it's popped up there on your screen and I would love, we've got 16 people on the line this morning already, I would love you to pop in there for me uh, your name and also what industry um, you're from. And you could even, if you want to put in, um, you could put in your role in, in that in that industry too. But I'm really keen again, um, and I'm hoping to see, look, I'm going to start uh, calling some people out um, if I know that you're online. So um, yeah, we've got a few in the, um, uh, from the ag sector, which is fabulous and, and good to see. Um, so, the other little bit of um, uh, housekeeping and those who were online with us uh, yesterday, uh, I have sent through another worksheet. Um, it was supposed to be beautifully laid out and tidy like this. It was PDF'd um, at my end, not Julie's end, and was a bit skew if and I didn't realise until it was almost too late, for which I'm very sorry. That being said, the content is important, not necessarily the layout. So um, I can, if I ask you to print that out, um, have a look at it and we will work through that um, to, in an attempt to make the session a little bit more interactive. Again, um, we are very much, uh, it's, it's a webinar style event. So I don't know really who's, um, uh, if, if I'm hitting the mark, again, we've got a big two hours that I could just talk at you. Anyone who has heard me speak about um, staff management, time management, um, or managing yourself and your people before, some of these these things will be familiar, but it's always nice to have a reminder. Um, by all means, uh, I will do my darndest to keep an eye on the chat as we go. Um, but if I could ask you um, uh, to, yeah, to bring up comments, make some, um, uh, make some noise in the chat box throughout the course of the um, workshop, I'll really do my best to keep an eye on those um, and answer your questions as we go. Um, and also at the end, we'll allow some time for questions as well. Um, so majority of the people online, um, we are, are based in agriculture. We've got someone in construction there. Um, but the best thing about what we're going to talk about today is um, people are people. Uh, the Fair Work Act is, um, uh, is the Fair Work Act. Uh, the legislation that relates to and the operational provisions that relate to being an employer of choice 
are the same. So please know that it's not about great. We've got everyone here from a certain industry. We can talk about that industry. Um, I'm. You often use the example of how a CEO can move from the um, uh, from. Qantas to Telstra, not by getting their, um, their way around uh, uh, aeroplanes or, or telephones, more so by understanding business strategy and how people work. So um, a part of today is very much um, about really acknowledging the value of the people in your business and also the role of you as a business owner, or manager or supervisor um, in, in making it all work. We are going to talk about uh, work Force culture and planning and the requirement to plan our workforce. Um, we have pretty heavy uh, ag uh, focused um, in the uh, participants today um, and there's some really incredible stuff that's unfolding in the ag sector at the moment with the absence of um, our transient labour force um, and also without that pull to regional Australia even though we have the lowest unemployment rates and the city has the highest. Um, the other thing I, I love talking about is getting the right people in the right jobs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that from a recruiting perspective, but also from a skills and development and mentoring perspective as well. Uh, the recruitment piece and talking about what that means and looks like to your business in an ever-changing climate. Once we have got the right people uh, apply for our job, how do we glue them into our business? And that's a process that um, we, you may have heard of, you've probably heard of inductions, but the process is called onboarding and, and making sure we're giving people that opportunity to really join our business and, and strike from uh, from the start. I will give um, two bobs worth on uh, getting the legal part of employing people uh, right, uh, because that's one of the obligations that we have as business owners, managers, supervisors, when we do engage others um, and recruit others. And then also make some comments around you know, well, if we get all that stuff right, aren't we there? And at the end of the day, uh, actually getting in and getting your hands dirty and putting some rubber on the road and managing your uh, business is a big part of it too. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, the experiences that, um, that we've learned through, and I have some qualifications in HR, but also we have delivered this uh, content to about 1,500 people. So there's a lot of uh, rich stories that we've got to share and also where you'll run into a business and they've got six employees that have averaged 15 years each. What are they doing? What is it that that business is doing right? And, uh, and, and what is it that we can emulate and, and, uh, and, and copy and, and do? And uh, I always uh, love in a workshop situation, there's always a couple of people that say, oh, I can't get a good person. And there's always some in the back room going, oh, I, I, I don't have a problem. And I love um, the philosophy that uh, I'm uh, a mum, I've got uh, three children that hopefully will uh, make a contribution to society one day, uh, and they will uh, go out into the workforce um, as young people. Uh, and I'm sure that this um, example will relate to those um, who have dialed in. If you think about your regional community, and most of us dialed in are from a regional community, there would be a handful or more, um, there would be a handful of businesses that you would love your children uh, to have the opportunity to work for, or you would love the opportunity to work for yourself. So let's put that those businesses here on this hand. And if I hope that you've got your video on because I'm gonna wave my hands around a little bit and point to the screen across the course of this couple of hours. There's also businesses in our community that over your dead body would your children ever work for. So they're on this hand. So throughout the course of um, the next couple of hours, we're going to talk about the differences between what these businesses are doing and what these businesses are doing. And when we talk about uh, recruitment, when we talk about business culture, uh, when we talk about um, uh, workforce planning, there are some fundamental differences. And it's these businesses that, um, that don't have a drama recruiting, they don't have a drama with retention versus these businesses that have high turnovers, it costs a lot of money, their production system, um, uh, you know, suffers. So I, I really love that, um, uh, that philosophy, I guess it is, but I also ask is that we're brave enough to have a look at ourselves and our businesses and, and what hand do you sit on? If someone said, oh, apparently there's a job going at the real estate agent in Bogabri, you're like, well, one thing for sure, you'd never work there. Versus, I don't know if there's a real estate agent in Bogabri. It might be the, the We War RSL's got a job going, oh yeah, everyone wants to work at the We War RSL. And we're going to talk in that thin labour market about the competition that exists in our team. So let's make a bit of a start. 
According to some of my observations, uh, the things that really do define this, um, you know, I guess it's a little bit of a kitschy term that we love throwing around an employer of choice. What does this hand look like? What do these businesses do? What are they uh, up to and what is differentiating them? And what is um, making a way for people to be lined up to work there? What is it that those businesses are doing? And in my opinion, I believe that it's um, there's a few things that they have in common. They really do uh, have clarity around their business direction. And I'm going to show you that same roadmap that I showed you yesterday from a business perspective in a moment and explain what I mean by clarity of business direction and clear goals. We're going to talk a little bit about the differences in, in personalities and people that we would like to attract and also generations because we are now um, looking at recruiting, and I always get my generations wrong, but whether it's X and Y, whatever it is, those sort of sub 30, um, those individuals are very different to anyone who was born in the, in the 50s um, or in the 60s or the 70s. Um, and rather than saying young people these days, um, they're actually not all bad. Uh, there's as many bad in the old people than there are in the young people. But they are slightly different in the way they think, the way they operate, and they actually like having buy into a bigger picture. So if we are looking to attract into our businesses people who are sub 30, uh, whether it's farming, whether it's um, you know a, a hardware store, whether we um, are running an air conditioning um, reconditioning business. Um, those young people are looking for the same thing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about that throughout the course of, um, of the, uh, the workshop. What they do like is buy into a bigger picture and they like clarity around um, exactly what success looks like to them and to your business. So, um, and I'm gonna give you a bit of a history lesson as we go through about um, these days, people are loyal to no one but themselves. So giving people that sense of achievement and fulfillment is really important from the outset. So businesses that do do a level of strategic planning, um, they can do this. They can offer this to, uh, to people and go, yeah, I really know what that business is about. It, it has a good feel about it. They know where they're going and they know my role in that. And don't get me wrong, these people want all of this in 60 characters, okay? So when I talk about effective communication, that also becomes a bit of a battle. But what businesses that are setting those directions, uh, that clear uh, direction from the outset, they also have the systems in place to get the job done. So they do have policies and procedures. Businesses um, that set guidelines, it might be rules, um, it is that, um, that structure and framework for success for their people really do bubble to the top as businesses where people like to work. We have this bit of a philosophy or, or uh, maybe a notion that people don't really like being told what to do. The alternative to not being told what to do is not necessarily knowing if what you're doing is right. And people don't like that feeling either. So don't be afraid to put systems um, in place. Our systems create success. So making sure that your business has solid policies and procedures. And once they're communicated from the outset and uh, enforced with consistency, there's a real level of fairness and equity in your workplace. Is that a pretty fair sort of comment? I'm happy at this point if anyone wants to say, yeah, that sort of makes sense. We get really nervous about being too sort of um, regimented, too much structure. Structure and systems in business create success team. Anyone in the chat box want to make a comment around whether or not, yep, they've seen that work or no, too much structure and systems makes it too clunky. What are your thoughts, team? Um, Regina Buchanan, I know you've got some good systems in place um, in your business. Uh, do you agree with me that um, systems create success? What about Jilly? The council would have some decent systems in place. Are systems creating success or are they causing uh, uh, a lack of known? Are they, are they causing frustration or, or how is it working? We've got um, lots of people in the agricultural sector in there, who else? Um, Joe Bell selling hardware at Bogabri, um, probably running a really cool show, I'm going to guess. Um, but I'm really would, um, you know, I'll uh, push home that comment that no, 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 it's not running a cool show. I'm thinking you are, or no, 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 systems, or I'm not sure what your no, no, no is all about, Joe. But I'm going to take it as um, as your. Hmm. you're running a cool show and just um, not agreeing with me and um, that, you know, clarity of business directions and those systems um, are useful. I uh, need systems desperately. You know what? Um, 
it, it's such a good point. Um, Joe has just been honest and said that um, it, the confusion and confusion creates frustration. So the other thing is, if we go, remember this, um, whoever was online with us yesterday, I put this map up. Businesses that do this, have this clear direction, have some goals set up here. They set the guidelines. They don't have their team out here. Remember we talked about bricklaying yesterday? We don't have people laying bricks out here that then have to dig up and put back in the right spot. You don't necessarily need um, to, to be involved in that conversation yesterday to know that this is the path to get the job done. And anything that happens out here causes a lack of efficiency in your business. It's a lack of productivity. It's costing you money. Okay, and I know people, I, I work with a really incredible business, um, did some strategic planning workshops with them, and they said, oh, we don't like being, um, being too regimented, and we sort of let them go off a bit and then pull them back on track. Well, whatever people are off track, it's costing you time, money, resources, energy. But the other thing is, when someone taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, mate, what you're doing is not right, it doesn't feel good, okay? You'd rather just be saying, hey, good job, you're on the right track. The reprimand that goes with people being on track, even if it's done respectfully and consistently, give the guidelines from the outset. I think that's probably a fairer way um, to attack the game. Anyway, again, just uh, my opinion and really happy to um, continue that conversation. Agree initially bringing in new staffs. Um, they might be, uh, yeah, bringing new systems in. Uh, it's hard, it's re retrofitting change into your business, but you are very entitled to, and if your current system is not working, absolutely. My key to success with retrofitting new systems with old team members is to engage them in the process. Because if you slap a new policy and procedure manual on the desk of an existing staff member, they are gonna be really prickly about it. But if you say, hey, the way we're ordering our new stock or, or the way, um, you know, whatever it is that we're up to is not working, how the hell can we do it better? And then you have buy-in from the outset. The other thing is keep in mind that the good ideas don't always come from the top. So it might be someone that you have asked to pack the shelves in your hardware store or um, I'll go back, I'll find some, I'm, new, I'm picking on Joe here a little bit, but um, we've got an auto elect business on the line. Um, oh no, a partner with an auto elect business. Um, but quite often we've got a root, a plumbing and roofing and scaffolding and poly welding services. Um, at the end of the day, quite often people in your business are doing things in a certain way because they were told to. And once you have removed yourself high enough up the business that you're sort of just giving um, instructions out of history and legacy, maybe asking them, hey, you've been doing this for a long time. Is, is it the best way to do it? And they go, oh, well, I'm glad you asked because I don't know why we do that step. Or do you know we could save a bit of time and money to do it this way? Or it's going to be safer if we do it this way. So um, my take home and learning out of that is that Good ideas don't always come from the top. So engaging your team will increase that buy-in. So if you're retrofitting a system, don't say, oh, we can't change it. It's the way we've always done it. If it isn't working, change it, okay? Okay, that makes me sad when people think they have to keep doing stuff just because it's the way it's always been done. Um, definition of insanity, um, especially if we're expecting a different result. Um, team, business planning um, and structure. The reason business planning is so critically important is because we end up with the wrong people in the wrong jobs. Uh, we end up not necessarily filling, backfilling and filling gaps and filling gaps with warm bodies rather than skills. Uh, it might be that we end up, everyone has a season, everyone, every business has a harvest. It might be if you're a florist, it's Valentine's Day. It might be if you're, you know, an air conditioning business, it's going into the summer. Okay, every business has a season. What are you doing to prepare for that season and allow for the troughs and the peaks that exist in your business? Also from a business structural perspective, is the structure of your business, irrespective of how small it is, is it clear? Are the lines of uh, reporting, um, is there clarity there? Um, is anyone in the business without the skills that they need to operate? Is anyone out of their depth? There's some really good work done around the level of challenge that um, is applied to people and the longevity of that challenge and, and, and the burnout and the boredom and uh, how that works. But making sure there's a suitable amount of uh, challenge which can bring enjoyment without pe pushing people out of their depth so they burn out or, um, or bump out. And then um, most importantly, are the right people in the right jobs? So, um, 
Uh, absolutely, it's important that if there are anyone that's overworked or underworked that we have a look at that. The lines of reporting is an important one as well. Um, making sure people aren't reporting to more than one person, especially it might be a husband-wife team in a business, it might be uh, father-son, two brothers, whatever it might be. It might just be two managers. Unless there's real clarity, there can be a risk of what we call a triangle in the workplace where we shop for answers. Oh, I know that Regina's a soft touch on X, Y and Z, but I also know that that, um, uh, that Cassie, um, I can always get something over the line with her. Or if Cassie tells me to do something, I'm going to go and ask Regina what I, what, what I should be doing because I don't want to do what Cassie told me to do. Be really careful about those triangles in the workplace. That um, is... Uh, the triangles in the workplace that are um, that cause that frustration and that shopping for answers. Um, I'm stumbling here because I keep trying to read the um, the chat box at the same time, and I'm really bad at multitasking. But um, yeah, absolutely. Cass is saying that any um, policies, procedures, anything that you will um, Im uh, implement into existing teams is use the word draft. Um, it is so incredibly clever um, if you can, um, you know, say, "Hey, mate, th th this isn't the end." This is just the start. And the other thing is if people don't contribute to that draft, they really can't complain, team. So the other thing I'd say at this point is I'd, I'd put it out and say, hey, we really genuinely want your feedback. If we don't hear from you, we'll assume that you're happy with it. It's a little bit of a cheeky one too. By close of Business Friday. Uh, because otherwise we do, we do want people to have that opportunity to buy in or, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. We are going to put this system in place. We want you involved, but not necessarily... Um, uh, not necessarily, um, you know, give them the out clause to say, yeah, I saw the policy, but I'm not following it. Hey, Joe Bell, I'm not going to kick your ass. Um, I reckon we could have a bit of fun. Um, the other thing is, are we utilising our workforce effectively? And I think COVID has... Um, really demonstrated our ability to think creatively and get jobs done. Um, there's some incredible work that has uh, been done over um, COVID or, or since COVID has really kicked in around the value of people that are um, uh, that are working remotely and the outcome focused and increased balance and some of those sort of things. We're going to talk about what people are looking for um, in business too. So it's really critical that we um, give people uh, that a level of autonomy, give people um, an idea of what you're hoping for from that and don't get me wrong if you need to keep the hardware store open you can't give the person the choice and flexibility but when the flexibility there for someone else's business might be different to what yours is but quite often we're having people that are commuting long distances into an office on their own where they don't actually see anyone or talk to anyone we're just doing a working on a project when really in reality um it could have just been done just effectively in the comfort of their own home. So I love some of this work that's happening around outcomes over hours um, and looking also for skills over warm bodies. We we go, oh, we're, we're short of people. We need, we need a person, a man. We need a man. We need, we need, we need a, new, a new girl. Do you? Or what is the skill set that you need? Is there an opportunity to have a look at, um, you know, a contractor or outsourcing a part of the business? Is it that you need to have a jack of all trades where they're really mastering none? And so that sense of fulfilment and achievement for that individual is quite low because they're sort of scrambling. Like, oh, I sort of do the admin. I sort of do the social media and I sort of, you know, try and do the accounts and I you know then I also do the ordering and I do the marketing really is it best that we have five people in a part-time job and don't get me wrong that takes a little bit of managing but we're talking about business productivity um, and effectiveness here um, then also that um, and there's a nice typo there if anyone wanted to pick that up for me but there's um, that in-house versus remote and what needs to be um, in-house and, and what really could be outsourced and the outsourced also means you might have the skills in we or bogger bride but you can easily get it um, you know, uh, nationally, internationally, um, from outside our communities. Um, and then we often see uh, where we're not quite at the point where we need an extra person, but we're half a person down. So it's always a tricky one. So everyone's digging really deep. The risk of burnout and bump out is high, um, but where some people are, over, um, are overworked, especially through a period of growth, or where we have people that are underutilised, so the boredom sets in and they're working either below their pay scale or above their pay scale, having a think about um, what the skills are that um, you know people need uh, and whether or not they're being utilised, because that's where that sense of fulfilment and achievement can come from. Um, I thought you meant, you just meant really remote. Um, sorry, Cass, I don't, I don't really know what you mean. Um, 
I thought you just meant really remote. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remote, remote. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm sharp today, team. Sorry, Cass. Uh, no, really, really remote. Um, this is one of my bugbears. Anyone who has heard me speak about staff management uh, is uh would have heard me talk about this and this is putting the right people in the right jobs and we see this all the time uh what happens in business is we have a good operator it might be someone who is um incredible uh an incredible mechanic and we think oh he's the best mechanic in the shop let's make him um the workshop manager or we've got someone who is uh, an incredible hairdresser and before you know it the natural transition is to buy a salon Okay, or we see it in farming where we have a great um, operator, absolutely mechanically minded production system there on top of it. And then we, I think that the right thing to do is to promote that person to be a supervisor or a manager. Um, in reality, uh, good operators don't always make uh, good supervisors or managers or, or even business owners. And sometimes the best hairdresser needs to be left on the scissors. The best mechanic needs to be left with his head under a bonnet. Okay, this we see this happen all the time. And I'm going to ask, I really, um, I want everyone to uh, get to their keyboards because I'm interested in um, everyone to write one word in the comments that is suggesting the skills of a good, the qualities of a good supervisor. I'm going to stop talking for 30 seconds, it's going to be hard. Well, every single person writes one word that suggests the skills of a good supervisor. Okay, there's 15 seconds that I stopped talking. Maybe I'll drink coffee, I'll stop talking. There we go, look at these words coming through. Leader, communicator, open-minded, open communication, um, communication honesty, um, led by example, patient, good communicator. Funny that. Hey, has anyone ever worked? And I, I know one, while you're there, you're hot on the keyboard. Has anyone ever worked with a supervisor or a manager that wasn't a good communicator? <sighs> Thanks. It's my point exactly. And funnily enough, oh, oh, you're right. Um, if someone does not have the skills, of a supervisor, do not give them a role of supervisor. And we see this, the best thing we can do is actually not promote people that do not have the skills of a supervisor. Um, and the reason that, and look, I've, you know, got some, have a, where am I going here? Um, you know, there's a little, I think, is honesty there? Honesty, integrity, good job. Yeah, Georgie Craig, working for a, a supervisor who is not a great communicator really sucks. And, but it goes to show there, there's a dozen odd yeses. And it's frustrating, everything about it. People leave jobs because of this. Um, and then see, look at this, Katie, positive. We've got the ability to inspire and support. We've got that mentor. And, and don't get me wrong, the knowledge and expertise is important, but we do have a bit of this mentality that you'd never promote someone who couldn't necessarily um, do the job themselves. I know a lot of the women on the line, uh, Bryony Sinclair, Cassie Coleman, Stacey Storia, um, I'm going to add um, Georgie Craig, you, you got, could all run the businesses you run. Can you drop the oil out of a tractor? I don't mean to be rude. I'm sure some of you, you're going to stand me up here and say, yes, I definitely can't cause Bryony Sinclair can. But are you with me? Sometimes doing this, all of the technical skills of your business is not the important part. It's about getting this stuff right. The other thing I want to say at this point, team, is these skills can be learned, just like learning to drop the oil out of a tractor or learning to recondition an air conditioner or learning to indent stock in a hardware store. These skills can be learned, okay? There has to be a desire to learn them and there has to be a willingness to change and a maturity to change, okay? We need to, and a bit of the stuff we talked about yesterday, drop the labels. I'm not a great communicator. I'm not a great listener. If you're not a great listener, learn to be a better listener. So if you have a young person in your business that is showing signs that they would make a great supervisor or leader, do a bit of a ready reckoner of these skills before you say, hey, mate, do you want to step up? And quite often, that's the other missing link. Hey, mate, do you want to step up? Because sometimes, depending on the interests of that individual, 
the best thing you can do is leave them on the tools because that's where they want to be. They don't want to think about your business beyond the end of the day. And that's where we see, um, uh, we'll see someone uh, be promoted into a supervisor or manager or sometimes without even a lot of communication at all. Before, you know, you've just got people underneath you and more responsibility thrown your way. They don't actually want it. And then they're like, well, that's not what I signed up for. And then they start when you met the pay scale and all of those things. So be really careful around having that, that. Remember I taught consistency and communication and conversation with your team to make sure that where their position um, is in line with what they're interested in as well. Uh, comment there from Katie, it's almost worse when you have a great who communicates really well and plays above the line, then you change. Yeah, mm, yeah. If you've had an experience with a good supervisor, it's really hard to cop a crap one. The reason why um, this stuff's important is because these are the roles of a supervisor, which is that example with Telstra and Qantas. If you think about it, if you have these skills and can do this, you could run an aged care facility, you could run a hospital, you could run a grocery store. Like we've got, you know, I worked with a lady this week who had had a lot of experience in Woolworths, so, and hot, right high up in Woolworths. And she's in a completely parallel industry now. She's back in agriculture and kicking the lights out, but also with her learnings from Woolies. So how they go about managing people and managing systems and create strategies. So keep in mind that, um, these are the roles of a supervisor. Ask the people, do you like doing this stuff before we're promoting? Um, but also acknowledging that if you've got someone who has previously managed a childcare centre and wants to come and manage your air conditioning business or farm, or, you know, you probably no way, no experience. But really, what experience do they need? And, and I'm happy I, I can get a bit of pushback that I know appreciation of the industry is, is vital. And getting your head around the, the um, technical side of the industry is vital. But at, if you come without that and without this, we've still got something to learn. We've got a lot to learn. But if you've got experience in the industry, but we don't have this list of things that I've got up on the screen, it's really damn hard. So you've got a lot of learning to do too. Okay, so be really careful of who we're promoting. People skills really are vital, Regina Buchanan, I agree. Um, anyone have any questions or comments about that stuff, about the, that real value of, um, of planning and knowing what jobs exist? Because we're going to talk next about recruitment and, and where this fits and making sure that we've got the right people in the right jobs and how we find them. Any comments or questions on any of that stuff? Got ourselves up to 20 participants, which is great. Welcome to those who um, have joined us since we started. Um, let's, um, I love the chat, keep the chat going. It's giving me, a, letting me um, suggest that I might be talking to someone other than myself. Um, and let's talk about recruitment. Um, the best way to talk about recruitment is that little bit of a wake up call that we have a history lesson on our hands here and we need to change the way we think. Um, back in the day, say back in the day I sort of you know when you're one of those people that really can't afford to say back in the day but you're not you're too young too old to say that you're a newbie I think I'm fitting there somewhere back in the day uh, people were lucky to have a job and they were treated accordingly they really were um, they were uh, they showed up they were, they were marginally paid conditions what what conditions and um, they were they walked over hot coals for their boss, not necessarily out of loyalty, but out of fear of losing a job because there weren't necessarily, um, and there wasn't necessarily one lined up to go to. Um, in the mid nineties, there were more people than jobs. That was the way our um, unemployment figures suggested. And then we, we started this beginning of what we call a talent war, where we uh, have people who find themselves, if, if they have any talent, and we really want the cream of the crop here, if they have a talent, they're picking and choosing their job. And at that point, um, the wheels started to turn and things started to change. We had uh, people that could command more respect. We had people that could command more than just money, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, and then we also had, um, we introduced this concept of you don't sort of take a job and stay there if you're not happy. Uh, people are loyal to no one but themselves. They're not necessarily loyal to an employer because a lot of people actually live work to live they don't live to work so what we need is to understand um, that that is the um the paradigm that we're existing in as business owners and managers but what can we do in that space uh to take advantage of that 
Um, the global financial crisis helped this situation short, uh, slightly because there were a lot of good people that found themselves out of jobs and COVID possibly has as well. COVID's been a really interesting paradigm in this thin labour market. Um, my, my two bob on the, on the impact of COVID, we've had our COVID, we lost our good people across the course of the drought in regional Australia. We now have the lowest unemployment rates ever as we're trying to recruit out of our communities. But then we're looking over the hill and seeing people that aren't interested in coming to our amazing communities. So normally, what would we do? We would grab ourselves a backpacker. We also, um, in this mix, have 7% of working holiday makers leaving the country every month. And do you know how you get into our country at the moment? On compassionate grounds or permanent relocation. No backpackers, no working holiday makers. So the other thing that's interesting is if you're not really ready to go, so you're not one of that 7% and you're not coming, you've done your 88 days. So our seat warmers, and I'm going to say that respectfully, someone who might work in our cafe, work in our pub, uh, drive our chaser bins, they're not here. And they have no interest in leaving Airlie Beach. And especially when there's an adopter backpacker scheme, which is giving them a free bed. So for a couple of hours work a week. So we have find ourselves that um, we're in a really interesting situation where there is a high unemployment rate, um, but no interest in filling our jobs in regional Australia. We had a, um, a forum last night with Gundy Regional Council talking about utilisation of the um, um, traineeship and apprenticeship and school-based traineeship uh, funding, which is incredible. We have more apprenticeships and traineeships. Remember um, when we left school, so 25 years ago, uh, it was re a really big deal if you got an apprenticeship, it was you're a good operator. When now they can't fill their apprenticeships. But um, if we go uh, three hours what way east, there are more young people desperate for apprenticeships, but they won't. What is the package? What does it look like? And I think that's, I make that comment about package. What does it look like? Because this is our reality. Good people are really hard to find. They're also hard to keep. They won't walk over hot coals for our jobs. And not only will they not walk over hot coals for our jobs, they're actually expecting us to walk over hot coals for them. The other thing is uh, the money is the given team. So if you're thinking I just we pay the most, it is not enough. If I um, was to ask and put on the spot some of the um, people that are on the line, and I know there's some really incredible uh, business managers that we're I've, they're in the last few comments alone, if they were offered another $10,000, I'm pretty confident they wouldn't leave because the money is not the reason why they are in those businesses. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone wants to be brave enough to argue, because people want more than um, their money. They want the conditions to be, um, uh, to be reasonable or, or better than reasonable. Um, the lifestyle, people, um, I made the comment, they're working to live. And if we're working 50, 60 hours a week, we now know there's 108 hours left. So really, we just need enough money um, to do the things with that extra 108 hours that, um, we, uh, we, that we'd like to do. Um, and also the creativity and flexibility in the workplace. So, you know, when I'm talking a little bit here about job sharing, about I'd like to study, I'd love to um, train my son's soccer team, but the shop doesn't close till five. Could something, could I work on a Sunday and someone cover off? Like actually rather than going, are you serious? We're here till five o'clock. What is it that you can do creatively to acknowledge the things that are important to the people that, um, that you're looking to employ or that you do employ? The other thing is you think, well, I don't know what's important. Have you asked? Ask them. Why is it that you jump out of bed and jump on a seat on our bus and put rubber on our road? Because while someone is working for you, they're building your dream, not their own. Okay, so that's a really nice realization that if what is it that we can do to help them? And if we've got people in our business, and I, I um, work with a a farming contracting business that has just had a really young guy, a, a real go-getter, um, an incredible um, young bloke, and he was going places and, and it was obvious. So him operating a spray rig for this contract was not going to um, last very long. So a couple of things. We can be proud that he's moved on. 
um, which is a good thing. And we could, um, you know, work and, and mentor and motivate him to, to go and work for someone else. But what they did is they actually went in bed and they were spirit together because this young guy was going places. So being creative um, with um, offering those, that brightness of future to the, uh, the young people. The other thing is we get nervous when people leave. If someone has outgrown your business because you have built them to the point where they no longer have a role in your business, you need to be proud of that. That we really hate that concept of, oh, don't train him, he'll leave. Well, the alternative is don't train him and he might stay. So have a think about that mentality of, of um, you know, lifting people up and spreading people's wings. And you think also people go, oh, well, you know, I've just given four years of my time to that person and now they've up and left. Well, They've also given four years of their toil to you. And I also challenge if they're a young go-getter, um, uh, a young go-getter, they've probably contributed from the outset. So you have got four years worth of skin. Uh, Reggie's just said that the money is, is important. It is very important. And the three points are the deal makers. I agree. I'm going to say the money is important. The money is the given. So that's where if it's at a certain level, and this is the research, is say you need 80 grand to live, the 80 grand is the benchmark. People won't look under that, but once it's over that, it is actually the other things that are considered as strongly. So, um, you know, if it's like they'll lose a the condition but take an extra 10. So, yes, absolutely, um, it's all about part of a deal and a package because, uh, like I said, we're working to live, not living to work, usually. Um, and it's also tricky because. If you've dialed in as a business owner or manager, you, let's talk work-life balance. It doesn't exist. Work is life and life is work. So um, creating that expectation that your team will be on the same page building your dream is, is unrealistic. So we need to actually be on, um, on the job with some of this stuff. And look, the opportunity exists here that for those who really do focus on um, attracting, setting up a business that will attract the right um, people and getting the retention and attraction strategies in place will position themselves um, to, uh, to attract the cream of the crop. That talent pool will be available to you. You'll be on this hand attracting the good people than this hand. The other thing with these, these magic hands is if someone has found themselves working for someone who is an employer of last resort, the minute an opportunity exists with this employer choice, they will jump ship. There you go. Um, Nadine, we offer flexible conditions, but it must be important to define boundaries and manage. Absolutely. Look, um, before I talked about flexibility and walking over hot coals for people, I said that we're going to set some um, guidelines and have policies and procedures. And the other thing is, um, keep in mind, they're being paid to contribute. So um, it's not... Uh, it's not all about them. Like we do, whatever people are lifting for our business, we lift for them. But, you know, we're not also going to talk about uh, not going to suffer poor performance as well. And I think where we can talk about um, reward and reprimand in, um, in a little while and, and talk about the, the value of that. But it's a really nice point, uh, Nadine, that um, you're defining those expectations and managing against them. And I like that bit, the managing the expectations, because a lot of people define them and don't ever mention them again or don't ever reflect on them and whinge usually to someone else. People don't do what we expect. They do what we accept. There is a whole lot of people on this program that has heard that before because I say it all the time. It is my favourite line. So um, let's have a quick chat about recruitment. Um, and I, sorry, I'm just flicking some slides here. Um, I believe, and I've said these before, so it'll be a reminder for a lot of people, there are three secrets to recruitment success. Firstly, is really acknowledging that, um, uh, that it's a marketing exercise. It, we, it is a sales pitch. We are competing with our, um, our, our, uh, the industry we exist in, but also other industries. We're competing, if you're in agriculture, we're competing with our neighbours, we're competing with mining, we're competing with someone that can go and, you know, absolutely, if you've got some experience in a farm, I reckon Jo Bell would take you to drive a forklift in her um, hardware yard. So have a think about what it is that you're, um, uh, you're doing. What is your sales pitch? What is your point of difference? Why would someone come and work for you? Um, and also uh, we're competing... Um, 
we can we always know we're usually competing for customers not so much in our in our farming um enterprises but we are always competing for the best team and if you think about it you um i reckon if you know we looked at the bogabra and we were in narrabri communities we can identify you know that that absolute legend admin person or the absolute best sales rep in town and if she's currently or he's currently at the bakery you could pluck them for your dress shop just as quickly and train them around fashion if they've got the skills set that um, is transferable so being really conscious that we need to understand um, what it is that we have to offer and it's a bit tricky because we don't want to be um, we don't want to pop poppy syndrome so we don't want to be the standout but we do need to stop traffic here team we need um, uh, you know, there, there's a number of things that we can um, we can do, and this great um, first impression is really important. Um, if you think about um, an ad, uh, do you you want to look professional? People will draw parallels between a professional ad and a professional business. So setting that example from the outset. The other thing with that is is being available. Like if if you put your name or phone number on an ad for a job and you don't answer the call, people are going to wonder if I need a hand in the shop or on the farm are they going to answer my call so and also all the timeliness of calling people back the minute people um, engage and see your ad for the first time they're starting to make an impression of your business and this is the only thing they've got to go by um, the bureaucratic process and I, this might surprise some people we um, was working with a, a lady who um, had a nursing degree and she uh, had was coming out of uh, family time and was interested in going back and doing potentially doing casual nursing ship. She looked at the paperwork, which um, you know, you know these crazy online forms with the little boxes and the fifty-eight pages. And she actually put in the bin. She said, "I couldn't be bothered. Don't be that business. Uh, be really careful what you ask for in your recruitment process. If it doesn't parallel the skills required for the job, what does that mean? Development of a resume is a really complex document." If you are looking for someone who does not need the ability to develop a complex document, why are you asking them to develop a resume? Can they put some notes in an email? Can they drop a handwritten letter into you? If you think about it, um, usually if you are asking someone, and if numeracy and literacy might not even be a skilled uh, requirement of your role, you ask someone to produce a resume, They'll usually outsource it and it'll be generic and won't even reflect their, their, their selves and, and uh, their skills. Or they'll get someone they know and love to do it for them. If that person's away, like, oh, I'd love to apply, but Kate does my resume and she's away. So be really careful about the barriers we put in place. We do need to spread our, our net. Last night they said in Gundy that it's a 2% unemployment rate at the moment. So we can't afford to just be going for the absolute ideal candidate. We need to spread our net. And if we lose those people through clunky bureaucratic processes, we're in trouble. So be really conscious around um, bureaucratic processes. And I know um, I had a guy saying, oh, um, put an email address. Some people don't like ringing. I don't actually think I want to employ someone who doesn't want to give me a call. So if, is it, or do you, would you rather not just put an email address. It takes a lot of courage to ring, but also can cut, cut a lot of the, the slack and the evidence that I've put in my 10 resumes for the month. So I think you can get a lot more serious candidates if you go for a phone number over an email address. Again, just an, um, an opinion. But look, um, build a relationship with great candidates. And great candidates, if you're the one looking for a job, uh, build a relationship with a potential employer. Have a conversation with them. Give them a call. Um, also asking questions. Yes, absolutely. That sift introverts and extroverts and and you know what we can all make someone look great in a resume and the other thing is that conversation can really give you the opportunity to to cull um you know say look mate I'll, I'll take your number i'll give you a call if the opportunity arises and you can actually decide that they don't have a cultural fit um, for you and we're going to talk about culture in a minute Creating tools and benefits before and during that interview process are, are, is really important. Um, I need to double check. Let me see what slides I left in here about recruitment. No, I'm going to make some comments around where to um, advertise um, as well. So, and the short version of this stuff is uh, I love social media advertising. So if I'm to say that um, Warakiri Cropping is the best business I've ever worked for, that is worth seven times 
the value of if Regina Buchanan says Warakiri cropping is the best business to work for. It is worth seven times if someone else validates your business. If I say I've got the best burgers in town and, some, and I own the business versus Kate says they are the best burgers in town, that's worth seven times as more weight. Why am I telling you this? Because if you put up an ad and then we say we are the best company to work for, someone shares and says, I've worked here, the best company to work for, seven times the value. The other thing, so, so we can get that free validation from others. The other thing that we can do with social media um, marketing is, or, or advertising and recruiting, is we can pick up people that don't know they want a new job. So if we find people that are looking in the jobs pages, they're getting a bit desperate. They're starting to sort of really, they might be on a, a website or in a, um, yeah, it is a very powerful tool. Um, it, the other thing is if they're starting in that sort of job seeking stage, they're starting and they will sort of pick and choose. We want, if we're on this hand, so you know the, the employer of choice, we, there's a heap of people that have found themselves in roles and look because a business might have changed, management might have changed, supervision might have changed or something might have gone amiss or they could have chosen the wrong job. But they go, hey, I was going to stay, but hang on, one of these businesses are, are recruiting. So we're looking for those people who don't necessarily know they want a good job. So we're going to get traffic by default. We uh, advertised a job uh, at Deer and Bandy. It's a hot spot. And uh, we, it was shared... 60 times in the tw first 24 hours. It was, a good, it was a nice ad, it was it had a picture, it had some nice words. It wasn't about what the what, what we wanted, we need, boom, boom, boom. It's like, what we can offer you. Are you looking for a change? Are you looking for flexibility and um, variation in your work day? Do you, want, do you like wide open spaces? Like it was still saying that these are the things we wanted, but in a roundabout sort of way. Uh, shared 60 times and had like a reach of about 15,000 people. We filled the job. And it was with someone, someone's cousin or cousin or that wouldn't have ever seen it in the job page. So just a nice little random tip there that, you know, not a lot of difference when we were on during Bandy team. Um, but have a think about the tools that you can, um, that you can create to sell your business. Um, and, and what it is that you can do to, to remove, remove those bureaucratic processes. Um, the other thing, uh, other tip um, is that around speed. And I'm conscious that lots of people have heard me talk about this, but basically people don't wait. You know, that whole, um, oh, yeah, we're going to give him the job, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make him sweat. People don't sweat for you anymore. <laughs> they sweat for themselves. Don't make people sweat. It's not kind. And it's also not, you know, we want people to feel like, um, we really want them in our business. We want to go. Enthusiasm creates access. We want to be enthusiastic in the process. The other thing at this point is acknowledging um, that uh, the earlier that we can recruit, the more hope we have of stopping a bidding war. If And the other thing is we want to remove that doubt that someone is our second choice. If someone applies today and you know they're right, and I'm not talking about taking the first candidate, I'm talking about holy dooly, We've got a cultural fit here. They've got the skills we want. All we're happy to train. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Wow, we need this person in our business. Hook in and employ them. So my tip there is to remove um, an end date from your recruitment ads because you have, yeah, hey, um, yeah, Bob, thanks for the, um, you, you know, great candidate. We've got, we've got another couple of weeks just to see who else comes in is exactly what Bob hears, even though you say, yeah, thanks, Bob. We'll get back to you. We're just waiting for the um, ad to finish up and, Bob's like they're waiting for a better offer when really Bob is the offer. The other thing is if Bob gets an offer in the meantime, they're going to take the offer. So the speed is, is really important. So um, I don't know if anyone is surprised that at this point I've said make it easy and make it quick. Is that surprising anyone? Um, some of these learnings, I um, had the privilege of working with <clears throat> a lady by the name of Mandy Johnson and she um, is... She was a HR advisor for Flight Centre and she took Flight Centre from Australia to um, internationally and opened 400 branches for Flight Centre, we're all Flight Centre now, uh, across the course of two years, the woman needed to know how to recruit and really learned some lessons and wrote a book about it called The Talent War. Get on it if this stuff resonates with you. But I really loved her sim um, simple and pragmatic approach to stop making it hard, Stop making it slow. Stop making people sweat. Stop making people wait and get in and um, really um, get the job done, especially if the person's right. And this is the last um, tip that I have is, is this concept around um, 
employing for culture and attitude rather than skills. I see people who are put forward like their wish list uh, for for in, a, in an ad must have and I'm going to you know we've got 80 percent of producers on the line so I'm going to say must have four cliff ticket chemical accreditation experience with a tractor blah 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 my worry and then you're recruiting a basic entry-level farmhand you take a backpacker that doesn't have those skills okay but then someone who you want to come in long term you expect to have them and then when I look at um, the ad and I say oh so if someone doesn't have a chemical ticket would you take them and like oh yeah get it out of the ad if someone you know if they didn't have any experience they'd worked at the golden circle factory at nunda for the last 15 years let's talk about demonstrated um commitment to an employer if you've got someone that has worked you know their resume says you've got they've got tractor experience they've got their forklift ticket they've got a chemical accreditation one year one year one year one year how long are you getting them for one year and the reason they left every other job is because they couldn't get along with the team guess what they're not going to get along with your team either so be really conscious about employing for culture and attitude and providing the skills and training that you need. I've got other businesses that prefer to provide skills and training from the outset because they know they get the job done the way they like it done. Um, the other, if someone um, is toxic from the outset, they're going to be toxic from the start. Some of the things that we would really look for is some of that, like that positive work ethic, their ability to learn, their ability to get along with others, their perseverance and commitment to the job. What can they achieve? What can they achieve? And then also their commitment to the job of the employer um, in the past, because previous um, performance is the best indicator of their future behaviour, unfortunately. And I know, and I, I'm happy for someone to come and say, oh, that's a bit unfair. Um, uh, you know, people can change. Absolutely, people can change. And people can also stay the same. So what the only thing we've got to go by, and there might be one in 10, one in 50, one in 100 that change, and they had a bad experience. But do your researches, do your research, check your references, do a Facebook stalk. Our world is so small. Quite often, everyone, the, the most sinister con artists can find two people to put down as a referee. Ask, um, and, and when if you are talking to a previous employer, quite often they won't necessarily say too much that's bad. They'll sort of beat around and, can, and bush around the, um, the truth. One of my favourite questions here is, would you re-employ them? It's a cracker. Or oh, would you recommend them to family or friends? The answer's no, or the answer's a longer time coming, or the answer's uh, not clear, I'd be really wary. There you go, because I can say all the good things about someone, um, but would I recommend them or would I, to a family friend or would I re-employ them is a good one. But also um, there is some legislation around not being able to um, defame someone's character. So the part smart people in the world don't say too much. Um, or would say they prefer not to give a reference. But do your research. If, you know, someone moves from Wee Water Gun to Windy, I could find someone to ring, you know. And same, if someone moved from Gun to Windy to Bogabri, you could pretty much find someone to ring. So, and we can talk about uh, usually our reputation. And even if people don't know someone so well, their reputation will be underpinned by their core values. So if they're a hard worker and community-minded, so I don't really know them, but they seem to be a hard worker. That reputation can sometimes be enough, can be a nice validation. So I'm not sure if this surprises anyone, but a quick and simple um, and really enthusiastic and genuine recruitment process really does position ourselves um, to attract and recruit staff. Um, we're, I'm going to take a, a three minute break. Uh, we've got ourselves right on to 11 o'clock. I've timed that quite well, team. That was a bit of a fluke. Um, in your notes, if you don't need a quick cup of tea, make a cup of tea, or you don't need a, a personal break, in your notes, there's some questions there. Um, the first question is what changes um, can be made to the overall culture or structure of your business to be an employer of choice? So what is it that you can do based on the conversation we've had so far this morning to change hands? Or are you firmly on the right hand? Um, let's take a couple of minutes, take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk about um, 
legal obligations, onboarding and performance management in the next um, hour. Happy while you're uh, going, pop some things in the chat and we'll, um, we can have a look at those. Um, have a think about that question and even share something that you might do differently. And we'll come back um, in about two minutes now because I kept talking um, and talk about legal obligations. Sound good? Righto. Um, just by way of a bit of a summary, as people rejoin, I have the kettle boiled. Um, in the instance that your business culture is right and you are firmly planted on the right hand, the recruitment process is pretty easy. It's usually by word of mouth. And as someone leaves, they, they actually recruit for you. They find someone. They are spruiking about how blessed they were, how lucky they were to have the opportunity to work in your business. So if you are getting some of that really front end stuff right, I'm going to suggest that um, the recruitment part will be easier. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's my little summary on that stuff. The other thing is, um, yeah, we, we really need to acknowledge the, the core value of our people. Uh, and I think that's where some of that underlying culture stuff begins. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm keen to 
really change tack at the moment uh, and talk, do a bit of a um, 90 degree turn and start talking about uh, legal obligations. Um, I'm only going to give some guidance information today. Uh, if you're a producer and you're on the line, you would have heard me talk about the value of the workplace relations service that New South Wales Farmers offer, offers. Uh, but amongst your communities. So um, I know we've got a lot on from the Narrabri, We Will, Bogabri community. There would be uh, accountants that specialise in industrial relations and workplace relations. There will be uh, maybe HR specialists that work um, as consultants in this space and will give you a hand with um, some of the legal compliance, um, uh, you know, severance um, payments and uh, employment contracts and all of those sort of things that we need to have in place, which we're gonna talk about uh, quite quickly now. So when I say quite quickly, um, we, this workshop this part of the workshop could go for two days so uh, keep in mind I'm just going to give you the really abreasted version of um, this section today um, so uh, as an employer we really do have a, a responsibility to understand and following follow the work um, uh, the workplace relations legislation this is the Fair Work Act um, funnily enough the Fair Work Act was originally convened to ensure three things, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay and fair conditions. We were doing such a terrible job that it needed to be legislated. We needed some further guidance. So when you, uh, if we find ourselves complaining about the Fair Work Act, um, that's only, the only reasons that it exists is for those three. So, you know, if we put out the shoe on the other foot and we are um, an employee, uh, that we're probably pretty, pretty pleased that they exist. Um, the other thing is um, really important at this point that uh, the legal stuff, when we're talking about the recruitment culture stuff, this stuff is the given. So don't be thinking that we can be not meeting these obligations and find ourselves on the right hand. Um, we do need to be employing under um, a contract or an award. So depending on the industry that you exist in, uh, there'll be potentially a re relevant award. If you're not following that award to the letter of the law, we do need, uh, the, we trigger the requirement for an agreement um, and also an employment contract um, in place uh, will be a very useful tool. And look, all of the paperwork that is involved um, in administering and managing your team um, is for a few reasons. Usually an underpayment claim, uh, might be for a performance issue, and, uh, an unfair dismissal claim, could be an audit um, by the Fair Work Ombudsman. So really important at this, um, at this point that we do get the paper trail and the record keeping of our, our team right. I'm gonna talk about that as well. Um, we do uh, do need to keep those appropriate records, which will, I'll give you a little bit of a list on that. And look, along the way, team, um, if you want to take a photo of the screen, if there's anything that I put up, like a list of things, I'm going to do that. In So get... Um, uh, get ahead, uh, get ready to take a photo of some of the things I put up on the screen. So it's going to be some good checklists. Actually, no, I've provided them largely. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, in the, in the worksheet. There you go. And I need to send it in Word because it's pretty clunky. Um, we do need to uh, provide appropriate training. So we need to um, make sure that people are trained to do what they um, are asked to do safely. So that's a legal obligation. There's some legally um, obliged training depending on our industries, um, but also provision of appropriate training is also smart from a production perspective as well. Um, completion of an induction in the onboarding process, which we're going to talk about. And then that provision of a safe workplace. We're not talking about work health and safety uh, today, which anyone who's heard me talk about it knows I've I'm quite fond of it uh, and I could talk about it for five days straight but um, work health and safety is a whole uh, another beast but also something that if we're a business owner or manager don't put your hand, head in the sand with that stuff like the Fair Work Act the only reason the work health um, say the workplace health and safety act exists is to ensure people aren't injured or killed in the workplace so again not a big ask so not really um, a big deal if we need to put systems in place to ensure life or limb isn't lost, lost at work. Say that quickly. Um, life or limb isn't lost at work. So the Fair Work Act, what does it do? Um, it convenes a national employment standards. So there's uh, 10, really 11, but we, we bundle a couple in together. And the national employment standards, just gonna double check that I don't um, talk about them again in a second. Uh, yeah, I do. So I can 
come back to those. Uh, the Fair Work Act also uh, convenes the unfair and unlawful dismissal regime, which we're also going to talk about quickly. Any sort of um, industrial action, so um, uh, and, and also enterprise bargaining. So that union space is convened under the Fair Work Act. And then also the Fair Work Commission and the Fair Work Ombudsman, which let's hope you don't have a lot to do with them, because when um, you find yourself in front of the Fair Work Commission, it's usually through uh, some sort of issue that you've had with an employer. Um, there's some great resources on a couple of different uh, websites. The Fair Work Ombudsman uh, has some great templates and some great tools and calculators. Get amongst it, um, have a look at it and make sure that um, you're across it. The other reason I think it's important to be across it is because chances are your team are. So it is actually more utilized by employees than employers. So um, you being across, um, you know, things like, you know, people's entitlements, um, you know, award and agreement requirements, all of those things, get across it because especially, you know, this, this next generation we're talking about, they're across it. Um, the National Employment Standards are um, a list, I said 10 things, that, um, the 11th is um, domestic violence, um, a domestic violence provision where people can have some leave based on domestic violence. Um, look, uh, they, there is a lot of information under each of these. I could quick flick through really quickly and rattle off the top of my head um, uh, what each means, but ideally you'll go and have a look at all of them. So we're talking here, uh, maximum work week, weekly working hours, 38, Anyone in farming would probably be rolling their eyes at this point, but that's, we're talking about a full-time workload. Request for flexible working hours, where if someone's been um, employed for a certain period of time, they can come and request on reasonable business grounds to have some flexible working hours or conditions. Uh, parental leave, so some unpaid leave at the birth of a child. Uh, annual leave, which is a four weeks uh, annual leave that uh, rec leave that we might have known at. Um, personal carers and compassionate leave. There's a few different provisions under here. Uh, it's where sick leave sits. So personal leave um, is, and, and carers leave where you can take a sick day for yourself or someone in your immediate family or household. And there's a few things that fit. It's actually can be your mother-in-law and your you know, your stepmother and your stepchildren and it's a whole long list. Community service leave, where a uh, bit of stuff here around emergency pre preparedness. Um, we're talking here about, um, you know, when you've got to go to court, what's that called? When you're on jury, jury leave, uh, you know, voluntary uh, leave. Uh, long service leave is one of the few things that is still state-based. So um, where it's after 10 years of continual service, it's also award-based. So some of it is pro, can be prorated and can be prorated based on a few different things that if you leave a job after, for some awards, five years, some awards, seven. So just get across this stuff. There's lots of links that sit in behind on this website. Have a look in here and you'll find all the information you need to know about these uh, things. Public holidays um, are to be paid if you're a casual and you're supposed to work, work on that day, say Monday's your day or you're a part-timer, you can't tell it's a public holiday, you come in on Tuesday instead, it has to be paid. Um, people can be asked to work public holidays, but they can refuse on reasonable personal grounds. So say, for example, uh, Anzac Day is something that's special to you, that's reasonable personal grounds. Um, notice of termination and redundancy pay, depending on the size and scale of your business, whether or not you're required to pay redundancy. Um, notice of termination, people think that it's connected to your pay cycle, oh, we pay fortnight so we've got to give two weeks notice, it's actually not true. Uh, you actually have to give the notice in line with um, how long they've been in the job. And also there's an extra week there for some people, depending on age. Um, the Fair Work Information Statement, I really hope that um, that's something that's familiar to you. It outlines all of these things. It's a document that is to be given to every employee at the outset of employment. Uh, and you can actually be fined if you don't give it. It's a PDF. Uh, it's easy to download. Google Fair Work Information Statement. And, um, and it'll outline those national employment standards. The National Employment Standards team are not negotiable. So we can't say, look, I only give him four, uh, two weeks leave, but he gets my house in the Maldives. So even though they might even be better off overall, and can't actually um, negotiate the National Employment Standards. They're quite consistent, little few anomalies, but quite consistent across industries and across um, uh, across industries and uh, across states, sorry. There's a few things that are state-based and a few things that are industry-based. So um, Katie's come in and said that the IR support, they are amazing. Um, they, are they are incredible and yeah.
I can't rave about them enough and I get sad when my Queensland producers can't ring them. Um, so look, I'm sure people have a lot of technical questions about that. Um, I, the idea of putting that up is not for you to say, oh, could you let me know how many weeks it is? It's just to give you an idea that you have to be across it. If you are not across those things, you say, oh, we don't do holiday pay. That's not our thing. It's everyone's thing. The minute you employ, employ people, those things are your thing. Um, I want to talk quickly around types of employment and irrespective, again, of industry, um, this stuff is consistent. So I, um, everyone loves my file up story, but um, it's important that we get a handle on uh, the type of employment and, and which or engagement that we um, that we bring people into our business in. And what I'm talking about here is that of um, uh, the arrangement can be a contract arrangement or an employment arrangement. Under the employment arrangement, we can have permanent, casual or permanent part-time, okay? So they're very separate. Let's have a look at the contractor space to start. And we see... Um, there's a lot of work being done by the Fair Work Ombudsman and the Fair Work Commission in um, uh, mitigating sham contracting. So what's sham contracting? It's where people are um, set themselves up as a contractor, are employed by a business, but the contracting arrangement isn't a bona fide contracting arrangement. So what um, people will say is that an ABN it means they give an invoice, means they're a contractor. There's actually a lot more to the um, puzzle than that. We see um, even in the construction industry, it's quite common in farming, it is quite common. Um, and what we see is where people are provide their labor and nothing else. Uh, and at the end of the set period of time, they come into the business, they work alongside the employees. At the end of the, that pay cycle or period, um, the employees put a timesheet in, the contractor puts an invoice in. When in reality, um, if something, it doesn't matter what arrangement you call it or what title you give it. And I'm going to talk about this too with the casual and, um, and part-time, full-time employees. But um, if it looks like a duck and models like a duck, don't put a saddle on it and call it far lap it is a duck. So it does take more than an ABN to um, be a contractor. There's some really good little um, tools that are available to you. So there's a tool on the um, ATO website, which will allow you to tick, tick, tick um, the things that are relevant um, that, and I think this table is a nice summary, um, the things that are relevant uh, to um, the individual you're engaging to decide whether or not they're a contractor. The reason they're pushing back on this stuff is because usually there's two reasons why you engage someone as a contractor. They're trying to evade tax. So they're saying, oh, I've got a little farm on the outskirts of Bogabri and I can claim my ute if I am a business with an ABN and I can claim the horse feed um, if, if I go on labour as a contractor. Are you with me? Um, versus the business, the administrative burden of paying an invoice is a lot less. So where um, my only comment with this stuff is longevity increases the risk or risk increases with longevity. The longer someone is employed in your business, the higher the risk. The biggest issue that we see here where it unfolds badly is say, for example, that contractor is injured and is unable to work in the future. Um, potentially um, with a contractor, you can sometimes have them on your um, uh, public, not there, your um, workers' compensation, but also being conscious of super. So what will happen is you pay the super, you know, put at it, you know, in your mind, like I paid him, I was supposed to pay him 25 if he, if he was a casual, I paid him 35. That's plenty for him to pay his tax, him to pay super, him to pay his workers' comp or have some sort of insurance in place. And he doesn't. So when he's not paying his super, which he doesn't actually have to, in 25 years' time, when they say, there's an accident or they might get sick and they'll say, um, you know, I don't have any sick leave and I don't have any um, any super. And there'll be someone, it might be at the pub, it might be at a barbecue, it might be um, found via Google where they say, well, hang on, haven't you worked for the faithfuls for 25 years? And you say, yeah, yeah, but I've been a contractor. And they say, well, you shouldn't have been. You really are entitled to 25 years of sick leave and you're entitled to 25 years of super. And I can promise you now, team, if you're an employer, you will not win that argument. Don't get me wrong. Good people do desperate things in desperate times. And if you Google underpayment claim, workplace injury, yep, definitely worth checking, Lucy. Um, any of those things, the first thing that comes up is a no win, no pay lawyer. And there is no risk to that individual when they're in a vulnerable position. 
if you are going to an employer contractor for, and I'm, I'm pleased I've left this chart up for you to have a look at while I've been talking. If you're going to employ a contractor for just a few weeks, the risk, you know, his, his super value is not actually high enough to, for you to worry. Uh, some people pay super on behalf of their contractors, which is great. Some people have their contractors on their workers' compensation. Um, but just being conscious that your, your loyalty and liability to that contractor, if they're unable to work for you, is, is null and void. But if they shouldn't have ever been a contractor, and just so quickly, should they have been a contractor, some of the things in this um, table in green, um, do they pick and choose what they do? Do they, Are they paid? One of the big things, are they paid by hour or paid by outcome? So are they told we want three Ks of fencing, give us a quote? Do they bring anything other than themselves? So sometimes I can argue about this because I think your brain makes you a contractor if you've got a specialised skill set. But um, a contract master, for example, might have come and he brings a, a dog and a horse and he's doing a job for a week and then you find out he's a really good operator and you might keep him on. So he keeps giving the invoice. But going forward, he's not really a bona fide contractor. There's a nice indication, that, and I don't know if it's in that table, but it's usually... 70% of someone's income comes from the one source, um, they're usually not deemed to be a contractor. So that's a nice th thing about the people who work for you. you go, oh, he's actually here four days a week. So um, what, does it, what does it look like? The other thing is with this stuff, and it's the same with the casual employment um, provision, which um, I'll talk about in a second, is when people aren't paid when they're sick and they're not paid to have leave ho uh, holidays, they don't take it. You have people in the workplace that are sick, people in the workplace that are fatigued, people in the workplace that need a holiday, but they either can't afford to take it or they have no interest in taking it. So just being conscious. And I know people say, oh, it's, you know, it's just a way of worse, isn't it? And I ask why they do it. Oh, he wanted to. Who runs a show is my question. The inmates don't run the jail. It's your business. If you say, hey, mate, we love your work for us. This is the provision we're going to employ you on. Um, there's some good stuff in that. And it's one of the, I'm going to really focusing here on the things that we find people caught out with. Similarly, um, the casual versus employment, empl casual versus permanent work with a business. I've had a, um, a guy employed for 10, well, it was 10 years ago, two years ago, 12 years He's got a work vehicle, he's got a phone, uh, turns up, rain, hail or shine, drought, flood, he's there. No floods at the moment. He's there, eight to five, whether there's something to do or not, and he's a casual. There is nothing casual about the arrangement. The only thing that's casual is the fact that he gets paid a 25% loading and he has no sick leave, he has no holiday pay. This guy hasn't had a holiday for 12 years. So the risk of the casual loading, people can't see the forest for the trees. The 25% is in lieu of all of those other provisions which are outlined here. But um, unless people are racking and stacking that 25% to make way for a sick day, it can be a bit tricky. Again, if that person becomes ill, there is no um, provision or requirement to pay their sick leave. So there's a real risk to your business here, and especially if they then come back and say, oh, I shouldn't have ever been casual. I was guaranteed work. And if it looks like a duck and waddles like a duck, it, it's still a duck. So if it isn't casual by name, casual by nature. Um, so just a, a quick overview there of, the, of some of the different employment arrangements and just doing a bit of a check in your business and say, you know what? Bob's been at the hardware store. He started casual because he's only doing a few mornings and he's actually five days a week now and has been for a long time. Ask yourself what happens um, in the long term if Bob was to get crook, Bob hasn't had a holiday. What does it look like for your business? And again, short term, short risk. Um, risk increases with longevity. Same with the contractors. If he's only there, for, he's coming to drive ahead for a couple of weeks, take an invoice off the guy. Um, then I made the comment around, um, around awards and contracts. Most um, businesses are, are governed by an award uh, and most employees, unless they're non-award based because they're um, to a higher standard than the, um, an operator level award um, are, are governed by an award. There are a lot of provisions in the awards that are specific to that industry and we do need that to be um, those to be followed. The only way you can uh, vary the award, and there's only some things you can vary, is um, 
is by having a, a, an individual flexibility agreement or an enterprise agreement in place. Enterprise agreements for a cluster of people, IFAs for one person, and there's a whole different uh, suite of different provisions. Long story short, that gives you the opportunity to vary something in the award. It might be when hours are worked, it might be a pay rate, it might be we don't pay overtime, but we pay a set rate across all hours. So make sure that if you've just um, looked at the award and gone, oh, we don't pay that um, you know, that leading hand allowance, or we don't pay that first aid allowance, but, oh, we give him some meat, so he's fine. That's fine and, and once it's in writing. And we can't actually use non-monetary provisions to bring someone below the award. So just making sure, team, probably saying a lot of things here and you're like, ah, um, making sure that you, you've got a handle on um, making sure you, your legal obligations are being um, met. A few notes here on, on some of the processes um, and we're going to start talking about once we've got that right person that, that we want to employ, how we make it right from the outset and, and what are the processes and paper trail. And look, don't be too worried about writing this down because um, it is in the very poorly laid out handout that I um, emailed through and I'm happy to email a better version when I um, update my computer and it stops um, wonking my PDFs. So at the outset of employment, these are some of the things that I would uh, encourage you to, uh, to collect. I would make sure I've got employee contact details for emergency purposes, but also so you can make contact um, in the instance that, you know, they're late for work, whatever it might be. And then also that emergency contact space is very important. Uh, are they legally um, allowed to work in the country? Is there any visa, the visa um, verification uh, site, Vivo, you can check that there. Um, any training records? Are there any legally required um, training that's, you know, did they say they have a trade? They're coming to work for you as an electrical engineer or electrician, where's their trade? Have you seen a copy? If you haven't seen a copy of a previously acquired qualification, assume it doesn't exist. Um, even driver's license, are the driving your work people have get a copy of their driver's license? If they say they have had skills in a certain area, um, make sure you validate those skills and, and take a note of those too. Um, any medical declarations, this isn't necessarily about, um, it, it's about fitness for work. So if, for example, they're gonna be up and down a ladder, uh, fixing air conditioners, we wanna make sure that they're physically fit to do that. The other thing, the medical declaration um, part, and this is my work health and safety hat on, is I'm interested to know if there are any um, emergency provisions or requirements that that person has that I need to be able Able to respond to um, in a hurry. Are they an asthmatic? Do they have an asthma plan? Are they epileptic? Are they anaphylactic? Um, all of those things that really we need some urgent attention. I'm not talking about a bad back. I'm not talking, I'm talking more about the things that we need um, information on to respond to an emergency. Obviously, super and tax information, bank account details to um, uh, to be able to pay uh, to the right people. So, you know, making sure we're paying our pay as you go, paying super in um, installments and then making sure we've got a wage payment involved there as well. And then any sort of authorised deductions. Um, I know I've had employees that said, oh, they didn't say that they had a... Um, a parenting payment that was due to come out or whatever it might be. So making sure we're getting that information. The other thing is the other side of that coin um, is making sure that we're providing the appropriate um, information that uh, they need from the outset. So um, it, making sure that we have in writing um, some sort of letter of offer agreement or employment contract. The reason this is important is otherwise it becomes a he said, she said, and I promise you, if you don't have a record, uh, the employee will usually win. So start date, how many times have you gone, oh, I don't really know when he started, did he start before harvest, did he start before planting, what does that look like? And trying to flick back, did he start before the Christmas when we had that busy time or um, making sure that you've got that information, the pay rate, what the conditions are, what the working hours are. So it's really nice and clear from the outset. We're gonna talk about setting expectations. What are the conditions of employment? Um, when are they going to be paid? How are they going to be paid? Provide all this information from the outset. Um, an induction, uh, introduction to the workplace. Is there any sort of HR information, policies and procedures, codes of conduct? What are the things that are accepted in your workplace? What are the things that aren't? Um, the work health and safety stuff. So we're talking here around inductions, emergency planning, training registers, making sure that information is provided uh, from the outset, policies and procedures and the expectations and consequences of not adhering, but also um, the hours of work and making sure the roster and the, and the breaks and all of those little things that can cause frustration in the beginning and um, is uh, and frustrated. And again, provision of that fair work information statement as well. Um, team, the um, just let me, I'm interested to know um, 
Oh, I'm interested. I'm putting your notice because I really want you um, to make a couple of notes in your worksheet about the things that um, you, some of the improvements you could make from a compliance perspective. Um, just also a note here around um, some of the key documentation. If you were to call, be called for a fair uh, work ombudsman audit, this is the information you'd have to provide pretty damn quickly. So is there any sort of a, a, um, an award? And if there is an award that you are following to the letter of the law, uh, you probably, we might need uh, an employment contractor agreement, but make sure you've got evidence that you're following that award and you've been referring to that award. But also I'd make sure that at least there's a letter of offer and say in there that you're going to be following a certain award. Um, you need to make sure that the Nash, access to the national employment standards is available to your team and as, access to the um, fair work information statement. Might've been paper-based, could have been electronic employment records at that personnel record um, pay slips they must be provided within 24 hours I think it's 24 hours of the pay period if they don't want them put them in an in-out tray in the office send them to an email address get a way to get them to the individuals put them in the tea room if they end up dust covered that is actually not um, you know becomes less of your drum but making sure that we are doing our darndest to provide pay slips and making sure that um uh, the relevant information is on there um, as well. So uh, ideally things like leave, um, uh, accrual, uh, any sort of de deductions, being very specific if you are, if they have any entitlement, so it might be a leading hand allowance, it might be a first aid allowance, it might be a living away from home allowance, that that is very clearly identified on that pay slip so they can never come back and say, you didn't pay me that. So, well, well, I've added that extra $100 Make sure it's all very clear. The other thing to make sure it's clear is if you have anyone who's on casual, um, making sure that that casual um, loading is clearly defined and separate on the pay slip because otherwise people will say, oh, you paid me 35 bucks, but that wasn't uh, the casual rate. That was just the base rate because I wasn't going to come for that. So you should have paid me an extra 25% on, on top. If that's not clearly identified, even though you made the assumption and even may have had an informal conversation, you, you could be picked up on that too. Making sure that you are keeping evidence of training records and the induction process, a bit more work health and safety stuff in there too. Records of performance, which is what we're going to spend the next half an hour talking about, um, are required if stuff goes south and we're trying to defend an unfair dismissal claim. And also require a copy of the Fair Work, uh, sorry, the Small Business Dismissal Code in the instance that you employ less than 15 people and would like to call on that code as well. What I'm going to do now, I'm, going to, I'm actually going to close my lips for one minute. I'm really keen for you to identify three changes that you could make in your business. It might be from a paperwork perspective. It might be um, around uh, types of employment contractors. You might be checking something there. Um, it might be around your record keeping. It might be around um, your uh, the information you're providing in the outset. It might be that you're going to go back and never provided a fair work information statement. So let's take uh, one minute. And if anyone is game enough to share, I'm keen for you to say, you know, investigate X, Y, and Z or start separating the casual rate on their uh, payslip. Um, let's take a minute um, to answer this, a spot on that uh, worksheet to put three potential compliance improvements um, on the list there. Let's come back in a minute. How did we go? Anyone brave enough to share something they'd like to investigate following that compliance information that we've just presented?
no, that's fine. Uh, good job. Everyone's fairly compliant from an industrial relations, workplace relations perspective. I'm going to spend the last little while talking about um, the next part of people. So we've, um, we've got the right people in the right jobs. We've got a bit of a plan happening. We've got our legal stuff right. What about once I've decided to stay? Um, I'm going to go quite quickly through the induction and onboarding stuff uh, because I really want to get into a bit of performance management stuff. But look, at the end of the day, uh, induction and onboarding is that process of bringing someone into your business um, and successfully cementing them there for a period of time. So it's actually about... Um, establishing yourself from the outset as somewhere that they are pleased that they have made the decision is about where it's at. Uh, people make the decision in the first 24 hours of employment whether they've made the right choice or not. So it's really um, important that we get that stuff right. I'm sure, and I ask, and I hope I'm either going to see lots of yeses or lots of noes. Has anyone ever started a new job and the first day sucked? So we're talking, you walked in, you're like, oh, this is supposed to be your office, but we've been using it as a storeroom. Or, oh, you're supposed to have a computer login, but it won't be here. Or we ordered you a new computer, it didn't arrive. Or Kate, your supervisor, she's actually not here today. Has anyone ever had this experience? Maybe, maybe not. I'm also going to ask, yep, yeah, Amy has, yeah, all hands up in our office, good job. Yeah, hey, team, can I ask if, can you, Validate for me that it made you feel like crap and you're wondering what the hell you made this decision for. You're probably thinking, why am I here? You felt worthless. You felt like the decision wasn't the right one. I'm thinking that's going to be a few more yeses there. My next, the other alternative is, has anyone, uh, <laughs> uh, has anyone started a job where you walked in, there's a bit of a smoko put on, the boss even took time to talk to you, the new person, like the actual big boss. Um, they said, hey, I'm your go-to. They might have even had a little paper, pack of paperwork ready to go. They took you around. They gave you a tour. They introduced you to everyone. Has anyone done that? Surely someone has had that experience? Good job. Someone has had that experience. How did that make you feel? Bloody much better than the first one. So, um, yep, Katie's had both. There's a lot of people there that have had both. And we know that it takes a lot to recover from those bad experiences. And I'm with you, Katie, I know what I prefer. The, when the first day you're sort of floundering, you don't know what success looks like, you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, versus where you come in, you're like, great, this is, this is going to be good. The recovery process to recover and, and decide that you've made the right decision is, is really hard. And quite often, um, just because they've walked in the door for the first time doesn't mean they're going to stay, and especially these newer generations, okay? So get this stuff right. I'm going to power through this because I want to go into some other stuff. But um, make sure that that first day is first day, first few days is great because it will really make a difference. It will really cement that person in to start buying a ticket to your bus every day of the week. There's a list there, making sure they know what success looks like. Do they have a go-to person? Does the go-to person actually want this new person under them? If, you know, nothing worse than, oh, that's your work vehicle. Sorry, we're supposed to clean it out. It's still got the hot box wrappers in the bottom of it. It's actually not a nice feeling. It's, it's, it's not a lot of respect in it either. Um, but also that sort of welcoming, um, welcome pack, having the paperwork, being professional from the outset really does set a great example. But also um, really important that we go back and we make sure that some of that front end stuff, you know, the, the clarity of business direction, the guidelines, the, the goalposts, where the guide rails of your business are. And it's so easy to say, hey, just really want to be clear and upfront. Punctuality is important to us. Or we really want to be clear up front, attention to detail, customer service. What are the things that make your business great? If you communicate those from the outset by way of your core values, your business um, principles, that code of conduct and vision, the person goes, yeah, right. So when I'm making a decision around uh, whether or not I'm frustrated, I know I've got to hold quality, respect and customer service at the forefront and will actually impact the way that the, um, that individual conducts themselves in your business. It really does. What happens is we don't often have that conversation and then a few weeks in you're like, oh, I really got to, I've got to chip this bloke because he's always late and it's only five minutes but it's our bugbear or 
you know, like uh, we have this bit of a thing that we, we, we meet every customer at the front counter or, you know, that machinery maintenance is done on time and we've sort of didn't say anything, but now it becomes a reprimand. Has anyone been in that situation where they're sort of chipped about something, but not because they're doing it wrong because they didn't know? That's actually a really tricky position to put yourself in. It's not fair. And the other thing is, and I'm going to just quickly waft back here. Uh, sometimes I can do this quickly, team, and well, and sometimes not so much. Here. People are often out here because they don't know. They don't know they're out here. And then you're getting frustrated. You're probably complaining to someone else rather than setting these up and then they know what's right and wrong. And it's actually a really nice feeling, believe it or not. Now the joy is actually finding the slide again. Um, so get it right from the outset. Really get that stuff um, right, but clearly communicate it. And also say, look, you know, this stuff's really critically important to us. And, and it's the stuff that we base the framework of our, um, of our business on. So um, that for me, is probably one of the biggest opportunities for improvement that I see in business is clear communication of, of expectations. But then the last piece here is that people don't do what we expect, they do what we accept. So have you noticed here, I've said that this last bit, so it's okay one thing to say, this is what we want you to do, go about it. When that person doesn't do that, does anyone say anything? And the answer is usually no. You go like, oh, it's not, that's not the way we do things around here, but no one, don't say anything, is new. Say something, say something respectfully, early, the early, hey, you know, is everything okay? I'll just get you to show, show you how to do that again. Or oh, is everything okay? I noticed that that was done that way. And we're so terribly sorry. We should have um, given you some more instruction. If there is someone in your business that is doing something that you don't want them to do, it's actually on you, not on them. If you own or run a business, and you have people that are operating against your expectation and you're not saying anything, that's actually not fair. And that is actually um, your bad as a supervisor or manager. And if you don't like having those conversations, get someone else to run your business. It's a bit of a harsh comment, but it's true. Because what happens is we see people uh, spiral out of control where, you know, slightly do things wrong, 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 and then it ends up in a big bust up. Okay. So my comment is, um, be fair and equitable and respectful at all times, but get in and manage your business. Manage, d demonstrate your expectations. So there's no, um, no gray area. People don't like a gray area, but also be really clear in um, understanding and, and policing them and also demonstrating that there are consequences. What does that mean? Hey, um, Joe, everything okay? I notice you're five minutes late. Next day, Joe's five minutes late. Hey, Joe, as per yesterday, is everything okay? I noticed you're five minutes late. The next day, hey, Joe, I need you to understand, mate, that if you're late tomorrow, you're going to receive a, uh, a formal warning. There's consequences, okay? Because a little bit like we're all very pragmatic five-year-olds underneath, a bit like your five-year-old. If you do that again, I will smack you. If you do that, if you keep saying that without following through, I'm not encouraging smacking children. Mine didn't die. Um, but if, if we threaten, 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 nothing ever comes. We actually need to uh, make sure that our expectations are managed against, that they're policed and they're consequenced. So keep in mind, here I'm like all about, oh, look after your employees, look after your employees. I've come back and I think there was an earlier comment around, you know, we do expect. It's reasonable for you to have expectations of your team. You're paying them. Yeah, um, it was actually the dean said that you do offer flexible conditions and you, you come across off your post, come across the hot coals, but come on, we've got a job to be done here too. So um, accepting substandard behaviour in your business is, is not required. And the other thing with that is I often have people say, oh, he's not great, but, you know, we didn't say anything he might leave. He's not great. Let's hope he leaves. If you're on this hand, you'll get someone new. I know that's a really basic, simple thing that like just rolls off my tongue like it's easy. I know it's not that easy in theory, but I feel sad for businesses that keep people in their business substandard because they're nervous about having to replace them. Okay. And I'm going to say it again because it's one of my favorite lines. If people aren't doing what you want them to do in your business on your time, that's on you as much as it is on them because the only reason they're doing it is because they're allowed. So step up and manage your business. I'm going to talk about that a, um, a bit more in a minute. Um, just a little bit more of this stuff around um, what's driving your team. So they're there, they, they've started, they're meeting your expectations. And you're like, well, it's a really 
good operator. I want want them here. And I, I use him, her, whatever, um, in the long term. What does it look like? What is it that is going to keep that person in your business buying a ticket for your bus for the next five years? And people say, oh, I don't know. The question is, ask them. Saying, hey, we really love the contribution. What is it that um, makes you love our business and, and your job? And what is it that we can do to support you to continue that? And it might be... It might be progression. We talked about the right people and the right jobs. It mightn't be either. Some people love what they do. Oh, I love the fact that I can finish early on a Thursday to go to footy training. Happy days. I love the fact that when my my, my wife can drop in with our children and, and visit us in the shop. I, I love that. Oh, we're looking here flexibility and family's important. So, you know, did the, make sure your Christmas party includes the kids. Are you with me? So be conscious of what people drives people in their own life and be interested and invested in your team so you know how to reward them and uh, in line with their drivers. So because there's a lot of ways you can um, reward a team. And if I go around in a workshop, I'll get to, um, you know, if there's 15 people in a workshop and ask what's the most valuable reward you've ever received from an employee, employer, uh, I'll get to about number 12 before they say a cash bonus. It is other things, other ways that, that are in, it might be a training course. It might be attendance at a conference. It might be, oh, we had a, a great, um, we, we got a big tender. Um, and, you know, so the day before we, we all played a game of golf. What, what is it that you can do to you, for your team? And, um, and also it doesn't always have to be the same. Not one size fits all. Um, what else have we got going on here? Um, Having really clear, and I'm, I'm still going on about this expectation stuff, um, it's really important that we have that real clarity. And some it is through a position description, usually for me, um, where we can really clearly define those lines of reporting, um, what's expected of them, at what, at what standard, how often, what's it look like? People won't, will only do what's expected at the most. They won't ever do anything extra. So don't leave that grey area. Um, so... We've we recruited the right people, got the legal stuff right. And we've got that induction-y bit, right? We're sort of, we, we've got them sort of massaged into the job. We're sort of done, right? Aren't we? We No, 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 we're not. And I think this is where people get to that point and go, yes, Joe's here. No, Joe's not. Uh, we really need to get in and be managing our business on a day-to-day -day basis. And I made the comment, if you, this isn't your favourite thing to do, you know, all of those skills we talked about with the supervisor, planning, time management, delegation, communication, if they aren't your favourite things to do, maybe um, you are an auto electrician and the best thing you can do is go back out to your clients and get someone in to manage your business. Um, I was reading a really clever article about a very, very clever high-end hairdresser. And um, this person was going out on the, uh, their own, but rather than being the salon manager, she knew she could what she could do as a hairdresser and where her passion was, she employed a salon manager. She's never done a roster. She's never done the book. She's never done the accounts. She's never done the order, ordering. She owns a business. What a really clever way to, do, to go about it. So be careful and make sure someone, and what we see, especially uh, we see it a lot in the trades and in, in construction, um, in retail where there's it's a smaller business so no one is doing it all so well, someone is doing it all so no one's doing anything well so make sure someone is managing your business communicating regularly providing that coaching and mentoring on an ongoing basis to your team making sure there is that clarity and support and making sure that the communication is ongoing it's regular and it's effective we're providing that training the reward and reprimand is there so that's um and the reprimand, mate, I need to have a quick yarn. I know we don't like it. Um, we previously said this is what we wanted to happen. This is what's happening. What do you need? Some tools, training, time, support. What can we do to get you back on track? Um, it might be that reward. Keep in mind that uh, depending on um, how people operate, usually we are reprimanding private and rewarding public. Some people don't necessarily love that public reward, but also being um, uh, mindful that, um, you know, reprimand in, in public is, is not a, a good place to be. The other thing to keep in mind is that everyone has, um, everyone's different. So um, people come from different backgrounds and cultures and different experiences. So acknowledging that, rolling with the times um, around different generations. So if you're, um, or someone in your business is quick, so kids these days, you know, they've still got their Nokia 
flip phone or the Samsung flip, flip phone. Um, you know, we're, we're not very far and since our teachers said you'll never, you know, you won't always have a calculator in your hand. You want to bet? So keep in mind, generations are different. We've got, we've got some choices. We either stick ourselves back in the past or we move with the times, move with the future and allow us to see the good in the generations that are coming forward. They are the future of our workforce. If you do not want to embrace that, I suggest you downsize to the point where you can run your business yourself. The other thing is this personality space. So where we're looking at um, uh, everyone operates slightly differently. You know, anyone who's worked with me before might have done some HBDI, might have done some DISC, anyone, people might have done Myers-Briggs. Um, treat people not the way you want to be treated, but the way they want to be treated, which is in line with the fact that people do operate um, a little bit, uh, all a bit differently. And what are you doing as a business owner or manager to accommodate some of this stuff? Okay something anything or i um this business last night that just kept saying oh we're doing all this stuff and we can't keep people is your perception and your reality aligned because if you're doing all of this stuff and you can't get people and you can't keep them once you do get them there is something in this chain that is missing um the other thing is uh, we do have an obligation legally um, around performance management and, and avoiding unfair dismissal. And we also have an operational obligation. So um, from a, um, just by, where am I going here? Yeah, look, we, the legal requirement um, is that if something, um, if we are going to remove someone from our business um, and there's a few ways I'll talk quickly how to do that. Um, we do need evidence of that process. Um, we need to demonstrate procedural fairness. Um, but then there's also um, uh, real value operationally in having performance records and having performance reviews and having regular check-ins with your team to continue to recalibrate. And look, if we go to our roadmap, to keep that grey area quite tight, remember people like that. They like knowing every week that they're sort of back on the track, back on the track, like hug the line team, stay on the, in the guide rails. We don't want anyone wasting our time, energy or resources outside those guide rails. Just quickly, um, by way of ending employment, there's a couple of um, ways we can end employment. Well, this is the non-voluntary. The voluntary is where someone resigns, they might retire. Um, uh, I haven't talked about made redundant here um, either. But so there are another three ways that we can um, uh, we can remove some, someone can be removed from the business or separation can happen. But if we're going to uh, terminate someone out of business, there's two ways. There's either a summary termination, which is what we would know as instant dismissal needs to be pretty se uh, severe and significant, usually threat, theft uh, th or fraud uh, or assault, uh, where I would in encourage you to involve the police, but also where there is um, uh, a real uh, a risk to either the work health and safety, and there's a bit of a caveat there, but the reputation and viability of the business. Say, for example, uh, my sister owns um, a beauty salon uh, in Weewar, and um, I work at the beauty salon um, just down the road, and someone rings and says, oh, can I book in my eyebrows? It's like, yeah, but you do know that such and such down the road is having a special. I am deliberately and maliciously compromising the viability of that business. That makes sense? So be really careful if you have compromised the viability of the business by, say, for example, um, uh, putting Roundup over a non-Roundup ready crop, you have to be really careful that it's deliberate and malicious and not a training issue. So um, be really careful with any unfair, dis uh, any summary dismissal or instant dismissal, never dismiss anyone on the spot, stand them down and investigate. So I'm not saying they'll ever come back into your workplace, but sacking someone on the spot is really difficult to come back from. We need to get our ducks in a row and get our facts right. General termination is where we have provided that ongoing support, training, mentoring, um, any uh, opportunity to improve and someone has it. So general termination is where someone has um, has not necessarily met our requirements or expectations and they have been supported along the way to try and reach those expectations. I think um, the caveat for me is it's called unfair dismissal. So if I can say at any point, hey, this isn't going to come as a surprise, you're about to be issued a warning. If there is no surprise involved, I'm going to guess that it's pretty fair. But if you've been stacking evidence against someone and saying, hey, righto, Mark, uh, you were late this day, you 
backed into this piece of equipment, you didn't pack that shelf right, you didn't do this right, here's your letter of warning. That poor bug has no idea that they actually um, have done the wrong thing. So we've gone back to some of that earlier conversation we've had where that communication and that ongoing management of your business hasn't been in place. Expectations haven't been set and then they haven't been adhered to. And when they haven't been adhered to, there's been, been no consequence. If someone is doing something in your business you don't like, talk to them, not anyone else. Okay, so what we're looking for to avoid unfair dismissal is um, ensuring that we have been given those um, the concerns. But before the concerns are given, make sure we've um, we've given some verbal warnings and say, "Hey, is everything okay? I notice you're doing this. You're doing what can we do? Do your bit." Okay, because people say, oh, the way to uh, avoid unfair dismissal is to give two written warnings. Well, no, it's not. It's yes, absolutely. That's a tiny part of it. But what we need to do is making sure that we have that procedural fairness. The other thing that's important is providing adequate time for improvement. So, is, and that might be, it's not just time, it might be resources, training and support as well. And then if we, if that performance hasn't improved and I love the reasonable test where anyone who else who was reasonable would have improved, then we can actually have grounds at that point for dismissal. So unfair dismissal, just quickly, is um, where the, uh, we need two things to be right. We need it to be the process, so that procedural fairness and some records there, and we also need it to be fair, just and reasonable, so where the crime has fit the time. So some, um, yeah, making sure that the employee knew exactly the whole way along and that there's no blindsiding. There should be no surprise when we're trying to performance manage someone. Again, team, I've talked for seven minutes about um, performance management and, um, and dismissal when I could talk for about seven hours. So I was really conscious. I wanted to get lots of little tidbits um, in today um, rather than giving you um, one topic in more detail. So I hope that that's okay. And if there's something that's been triggered, by all means, there's um, plenty of good resources out there that you can find. Just quickly, um, by way of a bit of a summary for that, um, that dismissal stuff is making sure that all your entitlements are uh, calculated effectively. Don't ever have anyone in your business on notice. Um, also making sure that, um, that you, um, uh, if you are sacking anyone on the spot, don't stand them down. If anyone resigns, get some paperwork in place and making sure that this is a little bit of a procedural fairness uh, thing which people get caught out on is um, to ensure that um, uh, that people are invited to have a support person through any performance management conversation. A little bit of a, a loophole that um, the no win no pay lawyers often use. Um, by way of a bit of a, a bit of a summary to really um, round up and wrap up what we've talked about today, there really are a few commonalities in these people that these people don't do. So if I was going to encourage you, and if, if you're jumping ship and, or you are here and already um, what you would consider an employer of choice, make sure your perception and your re reality is in check. Again, if you're saying I'm absolutely an employer of choice, but you can't attract people and you can't keep them once you do get them, I'm thinking that there's a miss, there's a, a link missing in the chain. Plan your workforce, get the right people in the right jobs, make sure that um, you have a skills fit and that everyone knows what that organisational structure um, is, make sure expectations and there's clarity of business direction. Roll with the times. So understand um, times have changed. The labour market is slim. We need to recruit effectively. And we also need to acknowledge that different generations and different people operate differently. And the privilege of being a business owner is not enough for ma to make people want to walk over hot coals for us. Um, get the recruitment process right. Recruit, um, I, I would encourage recruiting based on culture uh, and attitude and fitting the business as much as skills. Recruit in the right place, be creative and know that it's a marketing exercise. Run a professional business, get your compliance right. These are given, people are not going to exist in a business that um, is not compliant in reality, but also people like professionalism. And last but not least, um, get in and run your business, manage your business. So once you get all of this stuff, HR isn't an event, it's an ongoing daily walk the walk, talk the talk, important part of your business. If you cannot operate without your staff, operate with them. And if you don't want to operate with them, downsize and run the show yourself. Hey, Jilly, I um, am 
open at this point for any uh, questions. I did have to duck off yesterday, but I'm, I have a little bit more flexibility today. If anyone has any questions, uh, I'm not sure the provision uh, to come off uh, mute, but I will, um, I'm really happy to uh, take any questions that people might have. Um, just by way of a close, we, um, Ray, we do run a lot of workshops for different organisations and industries of which um, the are thankful for the Narrabri um, uh, Council and all the associated businesses for putting this on. If you are interested in following along what we do, uh, we run a work health and safety boot camp, we run a, uh, a, a program that's aimed at uh, business owners and supervisor managers managing themselves first so they can manage their business. So it's uh, a bit of a boot camp there too. But even if there's any workshops, and we often like the generosity of the uh, Narrabri Shire Council, where our businesses are happy for people from outside the regional community to come um, and join in. So um, everything that we do, we try to put um, on the House Paddock Consulting um, Instagram Facebook page is the best way. Or um, we do have a little database that we're, uh, we're building so we communicate via a newsletter to people as well. So click me an email and I can uh, add you to that. But Julie, uh, day two, done and dusted. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much, Beck. I, I know, again, today it's been so informative. And I can already hear in my own head from the office here, lots of people thinking about what you've discussed and ways they can implement this wonderful information you've shared with us into their businesses. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you back. Um, we're very lucky. Thank you so much for being a part of our New South Wales Small Business Month events for 2020. Um, and thank you to everybody for signing up and participating in these events. It's all for the small businesses of our region and the state and Australia, more importantly. Mm, um, and been great. Like, yeah, I'd just like to take this opportunity again to thank our partners who've been instrumental in putting these events on. So the Narrabri Chamber, We War Chamber, Bogabri Chamber and Narrabri Industrial Network. Thank you again, Beck, for your wonderful work today. Um, I will be sending out this uh, link to people in case they haven't had a chance to jump on today but have already registered. Uh, please feel free to send us an email if you have any feedback. And there'll also be a survey pop up just after we yes. close this. Um, so thank you, everybody, and we'll see you very soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.